Nice. Cool. Okay. Let's get started. So today um, is my final lecture with you guys. And we are doing uh, collections and smart pointers as opposed to smart pointers and collections. Um, first, we will start to have a look at the, the common collections that you have access to in Rust, uh, the most important ones that you're going to need. Uh, a recap on pointers from C uh, and then in Rust. Uh, the concept of a uh, smart pointer and what makes it smart. We will look at two uh, smart pointer types, box and RC. And then we will finish off with trait objects, which ties back to last time, where we discussed the generics, traits, and all of that. So how can trait objects be used with smart pointers to allow for more flexible programming? And finally, a bit of the thought process, uh, like when you should use smart pointers, uh, when you should try not to use them, because they're not always good to use. Uh, but the main idea is... Um, uh, just to get an overview over this, and then the Rust book as well will have more details. Um, and of course, we'll do practical examples and some code throughout the, uh, the, the hours we got. Uh, so let's first just quickly define a collection. Uh, we have... Uh, a collection with we have uh, zero or more elements stored in a common data structure because uh, the collection can usually also be empty. Uh, the collection again can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Uh, that means it can either have types, uh, values that are just the same type, like a, uh, an array of integers is homogeneous because it has only integers. Uh, whereas uh, uh, you can have, uh, in some languages, you can have an array that can have this first value is an integer, the next one's a string, and then there's a float, uh, and that will be a heterogeneous container. So you can do both in Rust, but uh, the default and most widely used is a homogeneous container. Um, each collection will have pros and cons in terms of uh, reading speed, writing speed, searching speed. Um, how the data is stored and everything. So it uh, makes sense to think about uh, what you're going to use your container for before settling on one. But uh, if you don't have time to do that and you just want to use a container to store values, uh, then the default should always be a vector, which is uh, just a dynamically sized array. Um, then there are two main categories of containers. You're probably already familiar, but this is just a repetition. So you have a container that's associative, which means a value can relate to another value, usually in a key value pair. And that are data structures such as maps and trees and so on, or dictionaries in Python. Uh, or you can have them in a sequence, which is just a sequence of values, and that only stores the value and not anything that is associated with. That's uh, usually represented as an array or a linked list. Okay, so let's look at the first um, and most basic uh, collection in Rust. So we have the vector. Uh, which is a dynamically resizable array that has an efficient allocation and growth. Uh, it's stored contiguously in memory, and it uh, can be good for, for example, in Pentecast stack, general data storage and processing, and it's also should be your default uh, collection when you just need to store multiple elements. Uh, some good things about the vector is that it has uh, random access, and that means you can access any, mem any item in the vector. Um, randomly, so you can access element zero, element five, element six hundred and thirteen, and you can you don't have to go through every single element to get there. You can just instantly go to any element. Um, for example, in a, a traditional linked list, uh, you don't have random access. So if you want to reach the five hundredth element of a linked list, you have to start at the first one and step through everything until you get to element five hundred, and then you can access it. So obviously, that's way slower. But in a vector, you have random access. Uh, 
And since the data is stored contiguously in memory, that means um, each value is right after the other in, in memory. Uh, the vector is quick to iterate. So when you loop through all of the elements in a vector, it's uh, very fast because all the elements are right next to each other. And it's also very fast to add elements to the end of the vector. Um, since it uh, grows in one, one end only, and uh, it has a efficient allocation and growth. Uh, so basically, when uh, if you add enough elements to a vector, it will then just like when you go past the current size of it, say if you have a vector with two elements, and then uh, it has enough memory to allocate for two, and you try to insert a third, then it will sort of double its capacity. And uh, for every time you've sort of reached that new limit, it will keep doubling it. So we we'll go to, for example, two, four, eight, 16. And then you, in the meantime, you just fill up the space. So uh, some bad things, uh, memory addresses are not stable. And that is because of the allocation. So if you fill up a vector, uh, it has to be reallocated and moved to a new location. So if you have 500 elements and then you have a reference to one of those elements, and then you add 500 more elements to the vector. If in the meantime, it needs to reallocate where it's stored, uh, that means that uh, the memory address will have changed. So you cannot rely on having references into a vector. You should always like just store the index instead, and then uh, use that to look it up when you need it. It's also inefficient to add elements to the front of a vector. Uh, because uh, if you add something at the very front, then every single element after that one has to be moved one to the right. Uh, and that takes a lot of time, especially if uh, your elements are big. So let's uh, just try to create a vector. Let's go to our uh, example of the day. So uh, uh, today's example will have three files associative pointers and sequences, where we will have examples for associative containers, sequence containers, and uh, smart pointers. So there are a couple of ways to create the vectors. Since it is the most uh, used container in Rust or a collection, um, the, basic, the fastest way to create one is to use the macro. So let's uh, create V and then use the macro. So like print line, which is the macro because of the, you see the exclamation mark. There's also a vec macro that has the exclamation mark. So if you just do this, you can fill it with values. Like so. Uh, and now you've created a vector. So that's the fastest way. Um, we now have a vector with the numbers 1 to 10. We can also create a vector using vec new, which just creates an empty vector. Uh, in this case, we have to specify the type, though, because now it doesn't understand uh, what kind of values it's supposed to hold. So we can do that by adding another set of colons and then specify the type in here. Or we can do it by annotating the type of the variable with uh, vec uh, i32. And then, it, uh, then the compiler won't be inferring it. Um, we can also create a vec from something. So if we have a, a slice into an, a, another array, we can create it from that. We can create it from another vector. Uh, we can create it from strings and get the byte values. So if you try to use, uh, for example, uh, from V, it uh, should make a copy of uh, this vector. But uh, mostly you will be using this form or just creating an empty one and then filling it up with data. Um, so before we keep looking at the next uh, couple of containers, let's go ahead and look at uh, some operations that are common across uh, a lot of these uh, uh, collections. So create a vec and then common operations. So like in other languages, uh, when you have a collection, there's sometimes the need uh, to 
make changes to it, to search through it, to find elements or uh, transform them in some way. Uh, and we have that in Rust as well. So most of these operations in Rust happen through iterators. And the way we get an iterator to the vector is we go v.iter, uh, which just allows us to get an iterator. Um, and then uh, on this iterator, we can uh, uh, perform some operations. So if we wanted this vector to only contain even values, uh, we could use a filter on that. And the filter takes a, a value uh, and then it returns, uh, it takes a lambda basically. So, uh, and the lambda syntax, I don't know if we covered this before, but uh, if we just quickly show it, then it's basically uh, these two brackets uh, are the parameter list, and then this is the implementation. And that's the easy way. So this could be x i32 and then y i32. Uh, and then it produces a function. So lambda is now a function object. So we can call lambda with uh, two and four if we wanted to. And then, for example, we could make it x plus y. In which case, uh, the sum of calling this lambda would be produced to value six. Um, so that's the same thing when we work on the iterate, iterator of the vector and use filter. Then we take a parameter v, uh, which it automatically infers to a strange type. And then we have our bracket. So we can basically return, we return true from there. If we would essentially say that uh, we don't filter, we don't make any changes because uh, well, we say everything is true. So if we want to have only even numbers in our array or vector, uh, we would uh, use our value and mod it by two and make sure that's equal to zero. And then uh, this produces a value that we can assign. So let's say let uh, even only. And if we collect that should be mm. collects uh, collapses uh, an iterator into a collection, by the way. So if we try to run, that should work, assuming there are not some weird rustness happening. So let's run sequences. That makes sense. As we need to deref here. And instead, let us uh, instead do a for each on the container and have a, our value here. And then we print even value. This doesn't make sense. Let's just do this. So now when we have filtered a vector on only even values and we do a forage on the on it, then we get only our even values. So if we change this to one, then we would do processing only on the odd values. And we can do others to do could do other things as well. Um oftentimes um you may also want to transform the values. So now they're just one to 10. So if we wanted to have only the square of those numbers, uh, then we could use the other, uh, another standard uh, transformation, which is map. And it has the same concept as the filter. It takes a Lambda. So we need our brackets and the, and the 
on the curlies. Uh, and in here, we take our old value. And then we produce and map it to a new value. So if we went V times V, we would now end up with this square. If we change this to filtered value instead, it's more generic. Uh, so now if our filter is filtering only on odd values, then uh, then uh, we'd end up with 1, 9, 25, 49, and 81. Since that's uh, the square of 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. And here we're dereferencing V, multiplying it by the dereference of V, because it's a reference. But it probably would work without it as well. Um, but uh, since Rust will automatically do that here, but it's not wrong to use the the reference here, even though it looks extremely confusing. And the same thing applies here, so we can do that as well. But uh, for clarity, sometimes you need to, to reference, dereference it. Cool, so filtering map for each are all three operations that work on most iterators, and the iterators work on uh, all of the collections. So if you have any of the collections, you can get an iterator to it. And you can perform all of these operations. Now, on a vector, it's uh, the, some of these will be faster than on other data structures um, because uh, iteration is fast on a vector. That is uh, one of the uh, pros of the vector. So, um, but in general, you can do a lot of these on all of the collections. Then you have other things as well. So, if you just go through here, you can look at the, the max value. Um, and we can uh, find using a search. Um, we can do a filter map, which is sort of both. Uh, you can max by some predicates, so you can define what should the max be, which means you can technically make it the min. But all of these are common to the iterators. So. But these are the most common ones, and uh, you probably know them from other languages as well, which is, uh, uh, but this is how you do it uh, at the basic level in Rust. Uh, the next collection is uh, the VECDEC, which is a double ended array uh, that is contiguous in memory, except for a gap, uh, which is good for uh, queues, a double ended queues, or when you need to be efficient and insert at the front and the back of a collection. Uh, as a result, it's slightly less slower than a vector. So, but it shares random access. Uh, it's fast to add elements both at the front and at the back of the vector. Uh, like the vector, it's also uh, memory addresses are not stable because it needs to reallocate when it fills up. And because of the extra complexity, it's also slower than a vector because uh, insertion and reading need some extra logic to be able to know if it's going to put the element at the front or the back of the uh, underlying data structure. So this is how it's uh, defined in, in the language. It has basically a raw buffer and then a tail and a head. So basically we fill a, an array from the end and at the beginning. So. Uh, It would be if we had a lot of zeros like this. Uh, and we wanted to insert an element at the front, then it would put it um, here at the, the head. And if we wanted to push an element to the back, then it would be put here. Uh, and that obviously seems uh, like the opposite, but the reason is because if we now want to add something at the back, then we can add it after the last element. So we basically increment the tail for everything we add at the back. So we increment the tail, which points at the beginning, the tail goes here. And then when you insert an element, the tail points here which is why the next at the back is inserted here. And well, when we push at the front, it's put here. 
And then if we add another element to the front, then it's put here, which that allows us to increment the head as well. So even though it's called head and tail, they're sort of our opposite. And then when we iterate through the vector, then we start at the head, go here, go here, and then we continue here, here, and here. So what happens when they meet? So when we get have another value at the tail, another one at the tail, and then we add one at the head as well. This is when it needs to reallocate to have room for more elements. And that's why the memory addresses change as we have to double the size. And now we have more room to add things at the tail and the head. So that's how the uh, deck works under the hood. And the vector is obviously easier because it uh, just adds start at the front and just keeps going forwards. And then when it reaches the end, it doubles its size, basically. Um, so uh, based on that, that's why it's slower, because you have to do some logic on where whether you're working at the front or the back, and same times when you're reading and iterating as well, you need to start iterating here and then you keep going here. Uh, workings. Uh, the deck. Deck. Leave it in the code so uh, you can look at it if it helps. Uh, and now let's look at how to make one. So let's uh, put that here, uh, create a vec deck. Uh, so here there's no macro as I'm aware. So we have to create it with vec deck. We can create it from something. So if we have an array, we can populate it with some values. Let's just create a new one in this case and make it also hold integers. Uh, in this case, let's make it mutable because we're going to add some elements to it. And let's do the same to this one. Uh, so when adding and removing elements, it's uh, the same for a vector and a vectec. Um, so in the vector, we can use push, for example, the value 5. This will add an element add an element to the back of the vector. And it's the same on the VD, except here it's called push back. Since we remember from the slides that the vector supports insertion at the front and at the end of the, um, uh, the collection. Aim for Vectec. Additionally, the Vectec supports push front, uh, which will uh, put value at the front. Uh, there's also uh, insert, which allows you to insert something at a given index. So if you want to insert at index zero, the element 10, you can do this in the vector as well. But uh, this is the slow operation because now every the one element that used to be at index zero has to be moved to the index one, and then you can insert. So you can do this, uh, but it's slow. We're on a back. Uh, then we can re remove an element on a vector with pop that will take the element at the back. Remove last element. Um, and just get rid of it. You, you, it does return the value. So if you are implementing a stack or something, or you need a stack for something, then you can use this and assign the value like this. And the reason it returns an option is because if you try to pop an empty vector, that's uh, an invalid operation. So you will get nothing. Uh, on a vec deck, it's called the same, just pop from back and pop front, depending on if you want to pop the from the back or the front. So with a vector, you can also implement a stack, but you can also have the queue if you want to pop from the front. So it's a, or a double-ended queue, so you can work from both sides, which is why it's called a vec deck. And finally, you also have in both of them, uh, the remove, which removes from a given index. But uh, this also is slower because uh, if you remove an element from the front of a vector, then all of the other elements have to be moved uh, one, one slot back. Uh, 
so usually pop front, pop uh, back, and pop is uh, the best way to get rid of something. But of course, if you need to remove something from the middle, then you can do that as well. And it's generally not a performance issue unless you do it in a loop. Cool. Now let's look at the hash map, which is a key value structure that lets you associate an arbitrary key with a value. And if there's questions, just pop them in the chat at any time. Uh, so the main clue of a hash map is to be able to associate a key with a value. Um, it has an 01 uh, amortized cost of insert, read, and get. That means it's the same time, basically. Uh, on average, it's uh, it's a it doesn't matter how much you're inserting, how much you're reading or getting. It's uh, it's the same cost either, no matter what. Um, but it's not ideal for iteration because the elements are not necessarily stored contiguous in memory, and uh, you have the and it can also be slower depending on the hash function. So hashing an integer can, for example, be faster than hashing a custom struct. And uh, so, the, so the actual O1 or the cost, constant cost of the, these operations can be affected by the hash function. But uh, let's uh, go to our associative file and create one. So let the uh, hash map equal a hash map new. And uh, here again, we have to specify the type. So we have to specify the type of both the key and the value. So in this case, let's use a string ref for the key and an integer for the value. Uh, and let's look at how to add values to it. So we can use insert here. There's no push or anything on the, on the map. So here we have to insert. Uh, and we have to, so for example, let's insert, let's make this a map of uh, uh, names and ages. So let's have Bob be 43 years old. And then let's have uh, Mary be 88 years old. And now we have two values inside of our hash map. There is also another way we can do it. We can use the dot entry function. Um, and what this does, if we use entry on Mary, is that uh, um, it uh, looks for an entry Mary. Uh, so this is and returns an enum. So if we were to do this with a match and add the remaining patterns, so it can either be occupied or vacant. So occupied means that there's something called Mary already in the collection. Vacant means that uh, there's nothing there. So let's uh, give it the name E for entry. And based on that, you can do different operations. So if the value on Mary exists, we might want to do nothing because we don't want to overwrite Mary. Or if Mary is here, it's not there, then maybe we want to, uh, for example, ask for user input to see, hey, uh, type in how old she is. Uh, or we can just say that, uh, but now we were working on our entries. So on the E, we can do an insert. And E is the vacant entry. And we can insert, for example, 88 here. Or let's make it 90 to make it different. Uh, let's say we did want to do something if Mary existed. So we could take uh, the occupied entry and we could remove her, for example. We can in we can get the entry, or we can insert instead uh, another value like seventy. That uh, do we have to mark it as mutable here as well? Yes. Um. Anyway, so the entry syntax is very nice in that way because we can actually. Uh, do some different things. So if there is something there, we can ignore it or just get the value and only insert if we need to. Um, yeah. So that's uh, additional operations based on existence of key. 
Uh, and then you also have the same same operations as on the sequence collections. So you have you can get the iteration, do a filter. And the, the map as well. So I don't I don't want to spend time on doing it twice, but you can do the same thing. Uh, the B tree map is uh, um, similar to the hash map, except it's a tree structure under the hood. Uh, I don't know if you have algorithms this semester as well, but uh, if you do, then you will be familiar with a tree, or soon will be. Uh, but uh, this container is uh, ordered, so it's great for ordering values based on a key. So if you put, have the key be a string, it will always be alphabetical when you iterate it. Uh, again, the cons like a hash map is that oops, it's uh, not ideal for iteration because the values are not stored next to each other in memory. And uh, uh, yeah, so this doesn't matter for the tree, actually. Let's fix that. That uh, is uh, left over from the hash map. Cool. Um, but it's uh, it doesn't have the it's a bit slower sometimes, but on average it might not be so whether or not hash map or B tree is slower or faster depends on your use case. So you have to measure it if you care about performance. Uh, but creation is more or less the same. We just use the B tree map and create a new one. I have to specify again. So let's make sure it's a string to an integer. And then we can do the same here. So btm insert bob 42 and Mary 87. Uh, but the difference is that this will be ordered. So btm is ordered, hash map is not. And the way we will know that is if we go get the iteration to the hash map and for each element we use our lambda and print element yeah we need to actually specify if we want to do the key or the value so let's do the yeah let's print the key and then the value And dot zero and dot one works here because so if we look at the typer, it's a tuple. Uh, so do you see the zeros value? It's a reference to string, and the second one is a reference to an integer. So we can deref here, but I think for print line we don't have to. And then if we do the same thing for the BTM, we will see that this is actually ordered. So but now it's already ordered. So let's add just a couple of more. Let's add the uh, Xavier and Andreas, 18 and 24, and do the same for the VTM. So if you look at the order, we insert X, A, B, and M, and here it's B, M, X, and A. And then when we run this, which we might not be able to do because of completely different reasons, like so yeah, let's run the correct one. Um, associated. We see that oh, we should separate them. There we go. Uh, in the B tree, we get A, B, M, X. And now, accidentally, we also get A, B, M, X in the hash map, but that's uh, that's not a given. So even though it happened to be that way right now, uh, the hash map is generally not ordered. So uh, the order will actually depend on the implementation, and uh, some can be completely random. So the fact that it wasn't random this time is... Uh, is uh, random basically and i think uh, changing the order here will not matter yeah it does 
now we see the hash map is bxma and the other one is abmx so the fact that uh, this produced the correct one was uh, in fact completely random. even running it again we see that it's no longer sorted yeah, every time we run it it's different x at the front a at the front x at the front m at the front so if you rely on ordering then you should uh, you don't shouldn't use the hash map in this case so we were unlucky to have it be sorted the first time uh, cool before we go to pointers and start on the smart pointers let's have a uh, quick five minute break so i will be back at uh, 13 oh two
Okay. Let's uh, let's get back into it. Um Okay. Uh so pointers and rust. Uh so this is slightly different than the, in C. Um but uh uh most of the time it's easier. You never really have to deal with raw pointers. So let's uh, do a quick recap before we start on the Rust specifics. So basically the concept of a pointer is that it basically just points you to a place in memory and that's all there is to it. Um, and uh, it's usually aligned to some byte boundary depending on what it points to and the operating system. So on a 32-bit operating system, you have uh, pointers that take up 32 bits of space because they need to be able to point to 32-bit memory addresses. And on a 64-bit one, you have eight byte pointers because they need to point to 64 bits of uh, memory addresses. Uh, so uh, depending on the type as well, it can be aligned. So uh, sometimes are it's aligned to odd values, other times it's add to, uh, aligned to even memory addresses. So uh, it can be aligned to four bytes or eight bytes. So even if you're, so if you have a, type that for some reason is six bytes in memory it might actually end up being put on eight byte intervals so uh, that's something you never really have to deal with this but it's just uh, nice as a recap and depending on your operating system and the bit depth of your operating systems memory addresses um, it will uh, change uh, the size of the pointer type but uh, on your computer, every pointer will have the same size. So if you're on a 64-bit system, which most of us are today, uh, then uh, you will have 8-byte pointers. And that's the size of a pointer. Uh, it's generally a very dumb data type because it is just an address. You can so And an address is basically just a number starting from 0 going up to however much memory you have. Uh, and then there's some operating system magic on top of that uh, to map it correctly. And it's C, it doesn't even care what it points to. It, like a void pointer just points to something. Uh, then it's the programmer's responsibility to know what you're pointing to. Um, but on the other hand, it is very useful because uh, you can refer to anything of any size uh, with something that is just uh, 8 bytes on your system. So. Uh, in a very small package, you can contain some very big data underneath. Uh, but there are also some subs to uh, indirection that uh, there it's a it's just an address to something to the actual thing that you're pointing to. Uh, in Rust, we work more mostly with references though, and not the raw pointers, even though there are raw pointers in the language. Uh, but uh, hopefully, you will never have to touch them. That brings our uh, us to the topic of today, which is smart pointers. Um, first time the concept was used, I think, is in C++ at the introduction of C++ uh, 11 and uh, before then, which was back in 2011 and 2007, when they were discussing the first syntax of it. Um, and the basically the concept is that uh, it defines the ownership of underlying data and uh, manages memory for you in a way. Uh, sometimes before you use them, you should think about the problem that you're trying to solve with them. So if you're trying to make your program less buggy, have less null pointer errors and stuff like that, then those are good problems to solve. Otherwise, we just end up with uh, dumb pointers that are bloated with extra features that you don't need in the context. Uh, so the main reason to use them is to solve the common pitfalls of regular pointers. So double free. So if you allocate memory and then you free something twice, uh, that's sold with smart pointers. Uh, dangling pointers is also usually sold uh, in that um, the smart pointer knows uh, if it uh, has more utility features and functions to ensure 
it's not a dangling pointer. And a dangling pointer is when you point to something that has been freed up uh, long before trying to access it. And of course, uh, null pointers as well. So that's uh, these are usually the most common issues in programming today. So uh, or sources of crashes, at least in languages that have the concept of null. Uh, so it also manages the lifetime of the object that it points to automatically. So you just interface through the smart pointer and it knows uh, it will take care of allocation, uh, freeing and, uh, and the validity of the object. Uh, so it basically is a safety net on top of raw pointers and in Rust uh, you will uh, be using more or less only smart pointers if you ever need the concept of uh, of heap storage or reference values. So, uh, they can also introduce their own problems, which we'll take a look, look at in examples. And uh, the reference counted pointers uh, are useful, but um, they can also add performance overhead and things like that. So, And remember that uh, unless you've gone beyond uh, the course requirements, then everything that we've written up till today has not required smart pointers in any way. So you can write most programs without them if you don't. Uh, anyway, um, the types of smart pointers that we heart can work with in Rust is the box, which uh, translates more or less to this unique pointer type in C++, if you're familiar. And we have RC, which sort of translates to shared in C++, and then there's a weak pointer type as well, which is called the same on both sides. Uh, so let's start with the simplest one, which is a box. Uh, the box is a basic heap allocated smart pointer. Uh, it uh, allocates memory on the heap um, and contains stores the uh, pointer to that uh, heap address inside of itself. Uh, it represents ownership of this memory, uh, holding a T, and a T can be any type. And there is no performance already except um, the indirection when you access it. So you have to go through the pointer address and then to the object. So that is a little bit of overhead. And the allocation on the heap is also uh, an overhead because the operating system has to do the allocation for you since it's not just a stack value. And uh, if you had operating systems, then you should be familiar with the difference. If not, uh, you can also pop the question here uh, so it's good for managing if you have big objects in a place of memory then you can hide that big objects behind the pointer so when you move it around then you only move uh, the small pointer that's eight bytes around and you keep the big object stored at one place in memory so it never has to move uh, which is a lot faster than moving it around every time uh, something called trait objects that we will look at uh, you have to use basically a box for that in Rust. That's uh, unique to Rust and it connects with traits. Uh, and when you don't now know the size of something at compile time or Rust can't figure out the size, then you also uh, may need to re resort to a box. This is uh, the, the case uh, with recursive data structures like a linked list where you don't know, know the total size of it because uh, the linked list can go on forever and it contains itself, basically. Uh, so let's look at uh, some examples. I'm going to move on to the pointers file. Uh, so the basic concept is if we create a integer x and make it the value 5, then it's pretty obvious that in this variable uh, is stored the value 5, or technically the bytes that represent the value 5. Uh, we can also create y, uh, and this time we're going, to, we're going to use a box. Uh, so the way we create a box is to use box new, and then we pass any value. So we could pass 5, and now we have x, which is the value 5, and we have y, which is a box that hold, points to the value 5. So basically y does not have the bytes that represent the value 5. 
it instead has a memory address that points to a location that has the value five. Uh, the way we use them, so this uh, creating regular stack int versus heap box. Uh, so if we want to use this value with a print, then we have stack and heap. We can use X and Y. Uh, so using them like this should is basically exactly the same. So let's make sure we run pointers. And we have the value five in both cases. We could dereference it here with the star. Uh, since technically when we use it like this, we get the reference through the pointer, but it will do it automatically in this case. So, uh, but this is not usually where you want to use a box because you can just use the regular stack value. There's no purpose to use the box here. Uh, so let's go to one of the first use cases, which is to have a huge data set. So let's uh, call create a struct that's called big data. And it holds, uh, for example, let's say math like data A, which is then an array of 6,000 integers. And then data B is uh, floats and like about 5,000 floats. So the I32 and the F32 are both four bytes each. So four times 6, 120, four times 5,000, which was easier. Let's actually do a similar value here. Uh, so the total size of uh, big data is uh, 60,000 bytes or about 60 kilobytes, roughly, a little bit less, uh, which isn't really a lot, but uh, it's we can if we just uh, double this, we can start increasing the size quite a bit. Uh, but uh, now, if we create uh, our B with big data. Um, with two, yeah. Let's create uh, our constructor. Like so. Self. I guess I made a problem for myself by having to specify 5,000 zeros. Uh, but the, the point is the same. So let's just use 5 and 10 instead. And 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's assume that it's uh, way more values. Uh, so then we can again create a, a custom struct with a box. That's uh, essentially the same operation. We just go box new and put in a big data new. Now the size of set is just the size of the pointer basically, which is then uh, about eight bytes, but the big data can be 60,000 bytes. Uh, so if we then want to move it, uh, let's take H and we make it set. Then we're moving the value from set to H and now we don't have to copy uh, the value. We just need to move the pointer. This of course means that when we print it, Try to do this, then it should not work. Let's make it the debug one. And ensure that big data uh, uses the debug right to write this. In.
There we go. Uh, and then if we run it, uh, we see that this is an issue that uh, because we have moved set into H, uh, which means the values in set is invalid. So we can't do that. That's uh, the point. And then we print H and run it. And then we see our data is here. So let's just make it data. So when we did this assignment right here, the only thing that moved was the pointer and not all of the data underneath. So if we had 60 megabytes or even like t what, gigabyte of memory, the only operation we did here is moving the pointer, which is eight bytes, and that's way faster. So this is a good use case for box in that case. So if we say only moves the pointer, which is fast. Assume one GB of uh, nice. Uh, so that's uh, one of the cases. Um, let's uh, have a quick look at the box with trait objects as well. So a trait object is it's uh, any object that implements a trait T, but we don't care about the type. So, but what we care about is the methods available on the type. Uh, and this adds some overhead uh, because the, we need to, since we don't know the type, there it needs to be dynamic dispatch involved, which means the compiler has to go through a table of, of types and look up uh, which type is this and then call the appropriate method. Uh, in addition to the indirection, because you have to access it through the box. Uh, the good thing about this is it's very flexible. It's like having a, a like an array or a list of uh, interfaces in Java. Uh, and the trait object, uh, when you implement it or use it, it cannot return self because it doesn't know what self is. Uh, and also, it does it can't have a generic method since uh, you need to know the type to do to work with that. Um, so uh, let's have a look at this an example. So say we want to implement some sort of program, for example, a game. And in the game, we needed our trait object example. Um, well. uh, or le rather, let's say we wanted to make a calculator. And in the calculator, we need to do computations. So we need a trait um, compute command uh, that allows us to do a some sort of computation on a value. And this trait supports uh, the operation this has the concept of an execution so we want to execute a command and it has a reference to self and it also has a value f32 and it produces another f32 so this is our trait object it has the function execute uh, that uh, something needs to it needs to implement and it does an operation a value and produces another value. So this is our command. Um, then we want to implement, uh, create a struct, for example, plus command and uh, a minus command at the very basics. Uh, it has a delta. F32, which is the amount we want to plus, and the same here. And then we want to implement this trait for those. So this is sort of a recap of last week. So when we want to implement a compute command for a plus command, let me hit Alt Enter in uh, idea. And then the execution of the plus command is basically our value plus our own delta. That's what we return. So the value we are given, and we add the delta value. And it's exactly the same for minus command, except uh, it's minus. So now we have implemented the compute command for our plus and minus functions. So let's just collapse that. So now let's uh, say if we have a math program, or trait object example. Uh, we let's come by use a vector for this. So let's have a vector or our computations. 
and make it a vector of uh, some sort of command. So let's uh, make it a vector of compute commands. So that's our trait. So we want the vector to just store objects of the that has the trait compute command. And then let's fill it with a plus command where the delta is uh, 2.0. And let's also put in a minus command here where the delta is 3.5. And then a couple of more of these. So we add two, subtract 3.5, maybe add 5.2 subtract 1.5, and then we want to subtract another 0 0.5, add 3, and then subtract 3.1. So this is the operations that we want to do. We know that all of these implement compute command, uh, and we know that compute command has an execute. So let's our base value be 0. I make it an F32. Uh, and then we want to loop through our vector and apply all of these computations to our base value and see what we end up with. Uh, so that this is the so this compute command will be the trait object. Um, so let's go to computations for and get our iterator and for and this is where we hit the first wall. So the reason is that uh, we can't use command compute command just like this. Um, we can't, uh, so if we try to compile, it will say that we can't use it because it doesn't know the size of a compute command. And this is one of the reasons of using a box um, when we don't know the size of something at compile time. And commute, compute command doesn't have a size because it's just a trait, it just has a function. Now it happens that plus command has a size uh, that this is F32, so it's a 32-bit size or four-byte size because it has one thing. The minus has also one thing, and it's also four bytes. But it could be, uh, let's say, our square delta as well, if we had something like this. Now this would be a bigger data type. So, But, we, but the rest doesn't know. It doesn't know that compute command can have a size. So. The way we fix that is with the box. So when we use trait objects like this, we have to put them inside of a box. So because we know the size of a box, and a vector can only have a element that has a known size, and the box has a known size. Uh, finally, we also need to type in here because uh, that indicates that this is needs a dynamic dispatch when we interact with it. So it's like a dynamic as opposed to static at compile time. Which means we also need to take all of these and uh, uh, make them boxes. So uh, let's add our cursors to the end of the line and go box new. And make sure all these are now wrapped in the box curl structure. So now we have uh, uh, our trait object. So the basic of a trait object is that it box usually used in a vector when we need to iterate something that has a certain functionality. So we care about the functionality and the methods and we don't care about the type. So we don't care if it's a plus command, a minus command, or if this was a game, it could be move left command, move right command. You know, in, if you created a replay system in a game, then you could fill a vector of just, just the commands that the player pressed. And then when you want to replay the game, you can just iterate through this list and replay the commands. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with the design patterns, this is basically the command pattern from, from uh, the good old computer science theory. Uh, anyway, uh, when we have a box with a dyne of a trait, then we have a vector of trait objects. And now it's all only a matter of looping through. Let's take our command, which is a box, which is a dynamic compute command. And then this called command uh, execute. Uh, and the value is our base value. And let's make it mutable as well so we can actually work on it. So now for every command in our list, we execute that command 
apply to the base value. And finally, we print base value has changed to base value. So if we were to run this program, we would end up with 1.59999. And to make it a little bit more stepwise, let's also say base. And let's make base value and then let's like, make a copy. So let's uh, old value is the base value and then use old value and base value like this. So now we have our base and we can look at how it changes. So it goes from zero to two, from two to minus one and a half, one and a half to 3.6. And let's uh, also be a little bit nicer and format it to just two decimals. So zero to two, two to one, minus one five, minus one five to 3.7, 3.7 to that, blah, 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 blah. And then we end up at the final value. So this is uh, the basic of a trait object. And this can be anything. Like if you have a some other concept that you just need to share functionality, but you don't care about the types, uh, but the command pattern is just one of those useful ones that you will find yourself that you can get a lot of value out of when using a trait object like this. But they are not always the solution. So uh, then let's look at the other type of smart pointer. Um, which is the RCT, which is the uh, reference counting pointer. So this allows you to have multiple ownership, whereas box is a unique ownership. It's single threaded uh, when reference counting, so you can't use it in multi-threaded context. There are different uh, pointer types for that. And they're used when you don't know which owner will be the last one to access a resource. So if you have multiple owners with multiple lifetimes that share some resource, for example, uh, multiple persons sharing a desk and everybody needs to interact with the desk and you don't know who's the last person to leave the desk then uh, then that desk is sort of reference counted and only when the last person leaves the desk the desk disappears so the basic concept is that when you clone the reference counter the count increases and when it drops it decreases and when it reaches the count reaches zero then the resource is freed from memory uh, there's a function called clone on the reference counter type that you use to clone. And it also has the concept to use a weak pointer uh, to have references to the value, but they, they don't participate in the count that determines when to drop the resource. So you can have weak pointers scattered across your code and they need to, to use them. You need to make sure, hey, is the value still valid? And if it is, then, you know, now uh, then you can use it. Whereas the RC itself will always know that it's valid because it's a strong reference. So let's uh, look at the quick example of this as well. Uh, let's use here the reference count to the pointer RCT. So creating one is the same as a box. Uh, let's create a RC value that is RC new. And we want to have a reference count on our string from hello world. So this is our reference count value. So let's immediately print uh, ref count. And that is RC strong count on uh, RC. So if we run that now, we see that we have a reference count that is one, uh, which makes sense because we only have one value. And uh, then as soon as this block exits, then the value is gone. Uh, so let's create another one. Let's rc2 equals, and then we use rc clone, and we pass it the other one. And then if we copy this line, we can now see that the reference count is two. So this pointer is slower than the box because it, because it also has the overhead of counting and the doing some 
uh, counting magic behind the scenes. Um, so, uh, and the next point here is if you create a new block like this, so this would be, uh, for example, another class in another lifetime in a real program. So let's have RC3 equals RC clone RC as well. We could clone anything. We could clone the second one or the first one. Doesn't matter. And then let's print twice once inside of the block and once outside of it. So now here we see we are at one. Here we are at two. Inside of this block, we are at the three. But when we go out of the block, we're back down to two because uh, the lifetime that's defined by this scope uh, ends here. And then this variable that holds is a reference count to that string is destroyed. And then the reference count is decreased. So when we come here, we have decreased it by one. So now the, only these two are left. Uh, like I mentioned, we could also create weak pointers. So let's create a weak, which is uh, the downgrade from RC. Now, if we print this again, we will see that the reference count is still two, because this is a weak pointer and it does not it does not participate in the reference count determining when to drop the resource. So how do we use uh, our weak pointer? Because it doesn't, it's not part of reference, reference counting. So if both of these went out of scope, then this would be, uh, it would be invalid, basically. Um, we want to use this. So how to use a weak pointer. And the, the way we use it is we go and upgrade. We call upgrade on our weak pointer. Uh, upgrade returns an option, so it's it can be okay or it can be none, or some or none. Uh, and the reason for that is if these two values went out of scope, then the reference count would be zero, but the weak pointer just exists somewhere else and doesn't know that. So when we call upgrade, it will check um, the data structure behind it, like, hey, uh, is the reference count, like is the thing I am weakly referring to still, is it still available? And given that it is, we get some, so we can, we can match on this if we wanted to. If it is some, then we have our pointer here. And if it's none, then we get nothing. Uh, but a better pattern for this is if we use uh, if let instead and say pointer, actually some pointer like this, then that would mean, so if we are have a pointer value here, then we use it in here. And otherwise we can do something else if we care. But um, so if you haven't seen this pattern, then if let is basically like matching on just a single arm and then uh, ignoring the rest. So it's a bit nicer when we just care about one result. And what we get from upgrading it is an actual RC. So when we print the ref count in here, uh, then we can actually do some work on the actually refer reference count of the pointer in here. So uh, this is number three. So first we have our week. So let's just say, Maybe it's confusing now. So weak upgrade. Just to make sure. So like this. So we have our one, then we have our two. In this new lifetime or scope, we have our three, which then becomes two here. We create a weak pointer, which doesn't participate in reference counting. Uh, at all, so it's still two. And then we upgrade the weak pointer to get access to the data. And given that the data is still valid, we get our pointer variable. Uh, then our weak count is three, or our reference count is three, because now this pointer is part of it. So we can use the pointer now to, uh, for example, get the length of the string. And then we can do whatever we want with that, but we don't have to but we can use it through this variable. 
Um, and then as soon as this scope is done, uh, then the weak pointer has, sorry, the new reference counted pointer that we got access to is sort of out of scope, which means it goes back to two. And then if we wanted to use our weak pointer again later, then we could also do that because here it would be three. And then if we put all of this into another lifetime scope, then we would see that our values now would be slightly different. But that is no point here. But usually, like when you use this, then uh, um, like this might be in a struct somewhere, somewhere. This might be somewhere else. Um, could be game resources sharing a map or the students sharing a test. Um, the point is that if you need multiple owners and you don't know who is the last one to go out of scope. Uh, then the reference counting pointer is good for you. Mm. The references is something we have done with these pointers right now, with boxes and RCs. And it's basically about converting the box to a reference to the T. So box of T to reference of T. All the way up here, when we print, uh, we are sort of doing it here. So because this is a box, but we're printing it like a T, which is in this case, the I32. Uh, now I said we could put on the D star to deref it, which would take it from our box I32 and dereference it. So we get the value, which is I32. Uh, we can implement it uh, to any custom type. We can have dereferencing ourselves if we implement the deref trait. And the compiler can chain the references if needed, so which is called deref coercion. So if you have a function that takes a string, let's actually do that example. So this is like print my string, which takes a value that is a string, and just uh, prints your string and takes that value. If we then create a Our deref will bar and create a box that is a new and that holds a string that says uh, almost end of lecture. Actually, it's from. Uh, so, with this, we can call print my string and we can pass derefable. Now, derefable is a box of string, which is not the correct type because this takes a reference to a string. So if we take the reference to our box of string, that becomes, becomes a reference to string. And since string implements, a tr implements deref as well, that allows a string to become a reference to a stir, which basically is a reference to the underlying buffer. The compiler can, is automatically understanding that you can do reference to string and then that call works. So another way, of course, we, we could also go in here and take the sort of do it ourselves and get the reference to the reference to the string, which is the same thing. But in this case, we don't have to do the extra layer of dereferencing since uh, the compiler understands. But technically, this is what happens. We get the reference to the string. And then from there, we get the reference to the, to the stir. Now, and the way we would do that ourselves, uh, implementing the deref trait. So if we wanted to try that, we could implement deref for, for example, big data, even though for big data, it doesn't really make sense. So our target type is uh, the type that uh, we dereference into. So say we want to dereference into I32. And dereferencing big data basically produces self.data A of 0, so the first element of the array, uh, like so. So, and we have the dereference because that produces a reference and the output type is not the reference. So, so now if we, we, if we use our big data, which is here, 
now we could uh, uh, deref value. We could use our h and dereference it. Uh, although we might have to double dereference it. Type by 32, you cannot be dereferenced. So, yeah, because this is not really a type that makes sense to implement it for. It's just a. But the basic point of implementing the uh, deref trait is to. Is if you implement it on a type there where it makes sense. Um, like, for example, if you were making your own string class or your own uh, vector class, um, then if you implement this function, then you produce a value of this type. And that's what you have to do. So we can also make it, we can make it always produce five, for example. Or maybe we do want it to be a reference to an i32. Well, that makes no sense either. We can't simply specify two unless we do a reference to two. That would be weird. Anyway, uh, the point is, uh, if you implement this trait for a type where it makes sense to dereference it, then uh, then you would be able to use the same syntax. Well, um, drop is a bit like a destructor. Uh, and the types we discussed today, like vector and the box and the hash map and all of those guys have a drop trait implemented. And implementing the drop trait basically means that you need to, or you have resources to clean up when the type goes out of scope. So it automatically disables copy for that type because uh, if it has dropped then copying doesn't make sense anymore since uh, you have resources you need to get rid of. So. And the concept is that if you create a class that acquires resources like memory or a network connection or a driver uh, or some other IO connection, then when that goes out of scope, it should clean up after itself. So in the drop trait, you would implement the necessary functionality to clean up. And this happens in reverse order of creation. So if you wanted to create, uh, let's try something. Let's create a scope checker. Uh, it doesn't do anything except uh, when we implement scope checker, uh, we implement the default trait for it. So let's do that, and that produces a scope checker. And then let's implement drop for our scope checker. Well, uh, and drop is basically what happens when it goes out of scope and it needs to clean up. Now, this one doesn't have anything to clean up because it's empty. But the point of this is that we go print line, creating scope or a lifetime. Now, let's even say time equals instant now. So this is the time right now. And then let's do the same when it drops. So uh, destroying scope lifetime at this time. So let's also give it a name actually, so we can uh, so we can uh, recognize it. And let's uh, make sure the name here is uh, default. Um, so let's uh, try to use it. Let's make it actually a string. We don't have to deal with the reference lifetime right now. So now we have our scope check construct that uh, we have a default constructor that uh, prints that it's created. And we have our drop that prints when it's destroyed. So let's put that in main. We should actually create uh, a new function for it as well. Uh, function new takes a name and produces a self, and we create a scope checker where the name is given like so. And we make that the name. So now let's create a scope checker, new and call it main. 
let's create another one inside of uh, say computations so let's go computation iteration and then so uh, let's create another one inside of the reference counting lifetime ref count let's create one in the week thing week pointer and then if we run this we now see that we can also look at the pattern so so first we have yeah we should actually print the name of it as well destroying like so and let's call it name creating name clear and run unless i forgot something yeah self name um yes it's not available in here of course because it's uh, not created yet which means we need to go let let's see it was there access sc.name and then return sc and the same goes for the one above So now when we run it, uh, time is not found because I got rid of it probably. There we go. So now we have it. So if you start at the top, we now see that uh, it's creating main. And then it also prints destroying main right away because uh, we don't assign it to a variable. It's just uh, destroyed right away. So let's just call it underscore main. And now if we run it again, we see that beginning main is created at the 94820. And then at the very bottom, main is destroyed. So that's when drop is called. So here it was created, here it was dropped. So this can be useful to implement on some types if you want to know or keep track of when they are alive. Um, and likewise with all of the other ones, um, we didn't give them variable, give them any lifetime. So let's just do that. Otherwise, they will die right away. And now we can sort of look at the, the order. So the computation ones, they are created and they're computed and destroyed for every iteration. And the ref count is created and then destroyed in its scope. So now it's so you can sort of track the flow of your program this way. That's uh, just a trick that you can do with the drop. Uh, anyway, uh, let's wrap up. So. Before you start using this, um, do you need a container to be heterogeneous? That means it can have more than one type. Sometimes using two containers can be better. So if you need a type, a container for integers and one for floats, instead of putting both of the floats and integers in the same one, maybe it's better to have a float container and an integer container. Uh, are you really solving a problem with the smart pointers or just getting around something? For example, if you don't like ownership rules and you just reference count everything, then you're sort of not really solving a problem. You're just avoiding it. So don't use the reference counter unless you actually need it. Try to, or if you don't even need a smart pointer at all, you you can just get away with it, right? Uh, same with the data really need to be on the heap. If it's in a smart pointer, it's on the heap. Um, most of the time you can get away with stack data. So ask yourself if that's necessary. And think about your choices before you apply your quote solution to it. So uh, and as I mentioned, everything you've done up to, until now is basically without smart pointers. So don't really need them all the time. Um, I have a quick quiz at the end. So let's try to do that. And then we'll be done for the day. And I will, of course, upload the uh, examples and uh, uh, the code to to the wiki. So today we have a bit more uh, comments and examples in the 
code. So like, um, so it's easier to go and look at it and look up and use it as a cheat sheet in a way. Um, as for the practical uses of a lot of things today, then mm, most of it connects back to traits, some of it back to generics, like pointers can be generic on every type, like the boxes. And the collections as well can hold uh, any type of value. Uh, the trait objects are very useful, but uh, you don't need them as often as you need, for example, interfaces in Java. Uh, but all of the patterns here can be used in a real world example. So, uh, yeah. Looks like we will be three out of seven today. Yeah, don't really have time to wait, so let's uh, let's just run with three. So uh, of of our two collection types, what kind of collection is that? Is a hash map? Is it a sequence or an associated container? Nice. That is indeed correct. And the second one. Oops, I skipped one. Second one. It's also related to collections. What sequence collection would you use if you needed fast insertion in the front and the back? We have a B tree map, a VEC deck, a hash map, or a VEC. Nice. That's correct. And then we have the third one, which should be related to pointers. So if you need a single unique owner of heap resource, uh, what's the class for you? Is it weak, RC, or box? Nice. So the box is the one that has a unique ownership of a single heap resource. Uh, RC is the reference counted counted one that shares the ownership, so it's not unique. And weak doesn't have any ownership at all. It's uh, it just borrows what's in the RC sometimes and can be upgraded to an RC when it needs to be used. Uh, finally. Uh, what's the name of the trait that allows natural dereferencing behavior? So which trait do we have to implement for that? Is it the pointer trait, the ref trait, or the deref trait? Uh, so that's the deref trait. Nice, good job. And that's it. Uh, I will put, put the slides, the code, uh, both of those on YouTube, on sorry, on the on the wiki. And then uh, thanks for uh, thanks for today. This is my last time. So if there's anything you else you want to see, just uh, send a message on Discord. Uh, I was thinking of uh, doing an example where we 
use a lot of what we've done in like a real world context, some like a game or something else, like more practical examples. So if there's any interest in to go through uh, all of the topics in the rest course uh, in a real world code example, then uh, then I can make sure that we do that. So for example, if we you want to have a look at uh, a real world Rust project that produces uh, a playable game, then uh, we can create, we can, uh, I can do record a session on that. So we can look at actual uh, real world practical examples. But uh, if that's interesting, just uh, send a message or pop it on the Discord. And uh, that's it for today. So thank you for coming.